Hey, my name's Naomi. Uh, I'm a permaculture designer with a specialization on social permaculture. And I've discovered that, well, yes, it's a very emerging field that is combining permaculture with social design. Uh, a lot of people don't really know what that is. So I decided today it could be really useful that I make a video explaining to those who are curious about this, um, whether you're completely new to permaculture or a seasoned permaculturist who hasn't really given a lot of thought into the, how um, how permaculture really works on the social level. I've been spending a lot of time exploring, studying, designing, coming together with others who are practicing social permaculture, although often not using this title. And I now have a pretty clear idea as to how the ethics of permaculture apply into society. I'm an activist, I really care about systems change and improving the world before we extinguish ourselves as a species. And so I'm really sharing this video hoping that it encourages a lot of people to start thinking in this way and using some of the tools and ways of thinking. So I'm going to create a, a bit of a series. I know that these are low quality, the microphone's probably a bit crap, and I have a New Zealand accent, so I don't know how well you're going to enjoy this video, but thank you for clicking on it and um, supporting my ranting. Uh, I hope that you take a lot from this. Questions are more than welcome. So um, you may want to know how I define permaculture. It's a good place to start. Permaculture is living systems design. It's a complex living system design because systems, when they're partly wild and partly tamed, just as anything natural and organic is, right, um, you know, it's, it's wild in the fact that we didn't invent it. It may be a simulated reality that we live in for all we know, but we weren't the inventors of it. The human consciousness was not the, uh, the, supreme intelligence that caused this to be. And yet, we have enough intelligence that we elicit some very conscious um, altering and tampering around our environment. So the system which is inclusive of the wild and the tamed is beyond the mechanistic. Uh, mechanics, if you look at the Kinefin framework, which is one of the tools I may get to at some point, uh, you can look into this, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. -E it's an indigenous framework which um, it contrasts problems that are simple, that are complicated, that are complex, chaotic, and then in the middle there's disorder. And disorder is where we really don't have enough information, so we don't know which of these four realms we can start to solve the problem through. A lot of problems that we know they can be simple, and in which case there's a best practice, there's a very easy solution that we apply at all times, and they can be complicated, which requires a bit of specialist knowledge to run a series of tests, to prototype, to analyze, and to figure out what out of a series of things could be the solution. But living systems are complex. There's an added dimension. And permaculture is a complex living system because it, it takes an awareness of the ecosystem at heart. It looks at the relationships between all the parts within the system. And often the relationships are emerging completely new things that we've never seen before. So when we're trying to run a series of tests through an engineering mindset, a very rationalist deduction uh, mindset, which has its place, absolutely, um, if we're doing this for the land and for um, the wilderness, right, for forests, then we are going to find ourselves missing something. And at the same time, humans are organic, natural creatures, particularly when we operate in collective consciousness. This is wild and untamed and constantly inventing new things which we've never seen before. Take the current rise of artificial intelligence. I mean, who could think that we would invent something that had a rival intelligence as us? And all of digital technology. So permaculture really takes a lot of the emerging technology and indigenous wisdom about natural cycles and patterns and puts these two together so that we can ultimately live in harmonious and regenerative communities. And to be part of a system means uh, 
there's a certain amount of symbiosis. So you look after me and I look after you. And if we were breeding human beings to be exactly the same as one another, just as we do in monocrop agriculture, you know, an entire field of corn, and there are a lot of problems that emerge, so we have to artificially make up for those problems, and this becomes a bit of a war to keep everything the same. If humans are treated in the same way, as we kind of do in the industrial school system, we think that if we put A and B together, and then a little bit of modulation, and, you know, divide the sum of da-da-da, and then ultimately we're going to have a very good, well-rounded human being who can enter the workforce and do exactly the job that they're told to do. This actually takes away from innovation, from the emerging creative intelligence, which is inherent in all of us as designers on this earth. Um, by taking away diversity of each other, we no longer know how to support each other's needs. And some of the result of this, um, we might start to see indicators of corruption and of competition. And this really goes against what permaculture uh, stands for, which is earth care, people care, and fair share. And I do see some schools of permaculture teaching future care, I like to say there's quite a link between future care and fair share. Fair share entitles that everybody has not only enough to survive, but to thrive. Your fair share means that you can live abundantly, creating more and more life through the value that you create by being a part of the system. Everything that you put out is coming into something else, and that whatever else it is, also put something else which feeds the next thing and on and on it goes. This is how life supports itself. It cycles through many iterations of living beings. Um, so there is a similar way of looking at society and looking at permaculture. And I would say that corruption really is like an indicator as you might face when a, a gardener sees an invasive weed coming, a very aggressive species who are taking over half of the lawn, it's very tempting to say, hey, that's wrong. That's not meant to be there. And I'm going to remove it at all costs and continue to wage war on that weed. But a permaculture gardener would understand that there is information which is being offered to them through the success and the thriving of that weed. The conditions allow for that weed to do really well. What kind of conditions are there? Well, okay, there might be um, poor draining soil. And so it's too wet. And the weed is coming because it's a weed that really likes that dampness and thrives there. So instead, we can take that information and say, well, what could fill that need in the system which has other functions? So not only is that weed going to be healing the soil, but the plant we put in place of the weed could also create food, could create um, pollen for bees, shelter for other animals, fiber, um, energy, fuel. There are many other uses. And because the information coming to us, and because we're not being do dogmatic and just excluding things that don't fit into our worldview and our idea of the dream perfect reality, we're embracing the information as a symptom and able to look and address the root issue. I think this is really important in corruption as well. Um, we see that corruption starts to emerge because people are losing um, direct contact with one another and there's a lack of trust. That's probably just one of many reasons that corruption might emerge. But it's exactly this ecosystemic worldview where we look at the relationships and the conditions that something comes in, and rather than calling it wrong or bad, which would be a simple solution, right? That's A plus B equals C, there's a best practice, we know how to handle that. Society is very complex, and there need to be many different approaches to dealing with many of the unknown variables which are coming our way, only more and more as uh, as we go on evolving. And I would say that by s staying in a very industrialist, 
worldview, I think we've really outgrown this worldview. Maybe the rationalist, mechanistic way of thinking also needs to be included because it can do many things for us as a species, but it cannot be the only way. And so we need to encourage this diversity. When we feel challenged uh, by somebody else's worldview, this is a symptom that our worldview maybe doesn't have everything it needs. Maybe it's actually limited, and that challenge is a little bit frightening because there's unknown aspects to it. However, we can gain so much by staying curious rather than closed off to the information which is coming along. Um, so what else would I like to say about social permaculture? We can look at all the different uh, communities that we end up being a part of. Now, it's actually remarkable that we as a species can steer, you know, somehow through, it might be through religion or education or the law or the market, but there are ways that we collectively hold on to an ideology and it steers us toward acting according to the same rules or moral principles or whatever it is. There's a sense of cohesion which allows us to operate as a collaborative unit. We do a lot of collaboration already as a species. It's what we're designed to do. We fill in the gaps for each other. Um, we play sport and games by agreeing to a set of rules and following them. And within that, there can be a lot of room for creativity as well. This is more like the behavior of bees and ants and other type of super intelligence um, hive mind communities than it is like other primates. It's remarkable that we do this and it has led to um, a lot of providence and prosperity for our species, but perhaps too much. And by continuing to breed us into competition with each other, by trying to keep everybody subscribing to the same ideology, too much of a good thing means that we become very focused on competition and aggression. No longer do we make room for the wild forces. So I said earlier that permaculture, it could be seen as equal part wild and equal part tame. It's because to evolve, new things need to come along all the time. There is a, a need for creativity in order to keep us propelling forward, that's what makes it a complex living system. Life continues to innovate. And yet if we all subscribe to the same point of view, hostility and corruption can grow. And so that's too much tame and not enough wild. Social permaculture, as opposed to other institutional social, social disciplines, like sociology, anthropology, psychology, you name it, um, this is actually a way of being in, in receptivity to what is emerging, what is, and not putting a story on top of it, but understanding deeper patterns which are leading toward um, the emergence of the new possible. So what is becoming available to us, which has never been before? And this is a really important skill that I believe we need to start practicing with each other. You see it a lot in companies with lean and agile um, in the tech world particularly, but I've also seen other companies adopting agile. Um, this is a way of understanding that as you influence the system, the system will give you feedback. And based on that feedback, you'd maybe make a different decision compared to if you had made all the decisions ahead of time. So we are much more adaptive and responsive, which is really necessary when we're entering a time in human species where anything could happen. There are a lot of dangers looming on the horizon and also a lot of breakthroughs. And it's really hard to hold the dangers and the exciting breakthroughs um, and have any idea how it's going to go. 
How can we predict when there are so many variables and factors influencing it, each other all the time? It's really difficult to stand here as um, a young adult and choose what to do with my life when it's so uncertain what will be available to me in five years time. So adaptability becomes a skill that each of us need. And yet, I'd say that's the realm of spirituality, where a social permaculture is assessing how can we do this on the group level. So you may have groups um, in your home life, you know, the people that you live with. It could be at work or project teams or as a freelancer, other communities of practice who you're engaged with. Or it could be at the level of the community. It could be local politics or other activists you're interested in or um, people who go to the same gym or yoga studio that you go to. And we are operating in a collective and often very informal intelligence. But that doesn't mean that design is removed. In fact, um, there are ways that we can show up as individuals willing to collaborate and willing to come into a communion with one another, which allows this kind of an informal habitat to be far more um, regenerative and resilient. And this actually gives us a sense of real satisfaction and belonging. And there are different levels of belonging, but I'd say that... Um, this is one of the major ones to understand, is that uh, we are all in such diverse relationships throughout our day. And it, it again goes against that idea that we are just one single thing with one purpose and that we can be grown for that one purpose. In fact, we're very fluid and very flexible. So by having the container to make sense of who we are within a community, and how that community impacts society on a larger level, how um, such things as a critical mass for the adoption of a new technology. There are many technologies out there that could be improving life as we know it for so, so many people, um, and yet they're just not adopted. There are so many reasons why, a lot of blocks in the energetic flow of collective consciousness. So I think that something like social permaculture, even if you're not using this name in the work that you're doing, facilitators, healers on many levels, teachers, um, we're all doing a lot of this work. Um, there are even different ways of looking at leadership now. That's one of the social permaculture tools that I would like to get into in another video, is different ways of understanding leadership, that it's not just one person at the top of a pyramid, but there are different types of leaders depending on the situation, and each of us has the capacity for agency within a team. So the more we understand about ourselves, the more that we are able to scale up to a level where all of humanity can be responding to the emerging crises on the horizon. So what's a takeaway? I would really encourage you to look at the ecosystem model of society and considering that we are trying to stay in balance. There is no right or wrong. The left and right way, the either or mentality, really has no place in the ecosystem. In fact, anything that is there has a reason for being there. It's only our choice how we place it within the system so that everything can benefit rather than being in, in total uh, competition all of the time. If you look at a forest, when it's first starting out, there is a lot of competition. This is a, a very immature stage where trees are fighting for all the scarce resources. But as soon as you have maturely grown plants, they are giving so much more back into the soil and the ecosystem itself that collaboration becomes the norm. So as a forest matures, it becomes more collaborative than competitive. I have the same hope for our species. So, uh, balance is one aspect of this. Um, inclusion and doing things out of a curious and loving mindset. Confrontational rather than um, being afraid of causing offense and then shutting down your truth and allowing things to go below the surface. 
there is a sort of love which is challenging and uh, and that's really one of the major philosophies that becomes crucial when doing this type of work is to challenge because assumptions need to be challenged. Assumptions which we're holding on to can really hold us back and this allows for a growth of corruption within us or within a team or within an entire society. So be vigilant in calling out what you see and embracing the feedback that you're getting. In the next video I'll intend to go through David Holmgren's 12 permaculture ethics and how we can understand this on the social level. They make a lot of sense within in an eco village or a farm, um, but they each have a metaphor, and as abstract as it may seem, there are really actionable examples for how these principles can come into effect in our life. So I do hope that you will join me there, and that some of this information has been really valuable for you in understanding more about permaculture, more about society, more about how this movement and worldview can offer a lot to us where we are right now as a species faced with a total unknown, all of these obstacles on the horizon. Um, so do enjoy and, and reach out if you have anything to say.